and dawn start is best in Lake Wollongoola because there are few people about and the birds forage in the weeds close to the shoreline. Later in the day, they tend to retire out on the lake near the far shore where there are no people. If you are late, you may need a modest telescope on a tripod rather than binoculars. Depending on lake conditions, there may be few birds or thousands, representing a significant range of species. Wallambula opens to the sea for a little while from time to time, and this has a great influence on bird numbers and variety. Of course, too, from November onwards until March, numbers may be significantly swollen with transworld migrant species. Three species of white egrets generally occur on the lake, but in small numbers. Egrets and herons are very closely related and have similar lifestyles. The common cattle egret is absent, instead frequenting open grassland with livestock. By far the commonest heron in the Shoalhaven area is the whiteface, which can be seen along the ocean shoreline or around inland farm dams or anywhere that's wet. Even so, they are usually solitary and quite dispersed. The white-necked heron also occurs but is quite, quite uncommon locally. Both species, though, occur Australia-wide. Herons eat anything they can catch in water. Frogs, fish, crustaceans and pasture insects like grasshoppers. Nests are a scanty stick platform built on trees over water. Eggs number three to six and are a pale bluish green. Most people are very familiar with ibis, the white and the straw neck. They often congregate together in large numbers. They are an extremely important species economically, thanks to the huge number of pasture insects that they consume. Ibis are very gregarious and nest in huge colonies in the centre of swamps generally in more inland locations. Unfortunately, they have also developed a taste for human food waste and are becoming scavengers in city parks. The yellow-billed spoonbill is a local species, but we are more likely to see the black-billed royal spoonbill. It favours large, shallow swamps with open water well endowed with aquatic insects, mollusks and crustaceans. They will also take very small fish and frogs. Like ibis, they usually nest inland, away from the swamp margins in emergent trees. Pelican numbers on the lake will often exceed a hundred, but they are generally only resting there as there is little suitable food available. Arriving in November from the Arctic Circle, Northern Europe and Northern Asia, are the Godwits. A few seem to be resident or they don't migrate. Possibly they are immature birds not ready to breed. Most have left to return to the Arctic by March. Breeding season in the north is July. Another visitor from the north is the sharp-tailed sandpiper. It too breeds in the Arctic Circle in Siberia. They are often seen with godwits, 
though the sandpiper is smaller, has a much shorter beak, and so feeds on aquatic life from the surface of the mud or in the weeds and algae. The algae forms a thick soup in the warm sun. At times, flies and their larvae are very plentiful, feeding on the algae, where the keen-eyed sandpipers can pick them off in great numbers. Those conditions also produce lots of other aquatic morsels, including small crustaceans and worms. Like the godwits, the sandpipers have usually left by March. There are also other small migratory waders that visit Wollongbilla, but it can be quite difficult to identify them at a distance, particularly as they are generally in non-breeding plumage. Crested terns are common, but they generally only use Lake Wollongbilla as a rest area. They are really an oceanic species. They nest on offshore islands. Pied oyster catchers are much more common on Comorong Island or at Shoalhaven Heads when the river outlet to the sea has closed off and large areas of mud and wet sand are exposed. They sometimes nest at Lake Wollongbilla. Their courtship ritual entails a lot of bowing to potential partners. In some seasons, the black swans are very plentiful, often numbering in their thousands. Young birds do not acquire their distinctive red beak until they have matured. Sometimes the swans are accompanied by chestnut teal, which are often also seen on salt lagoons, saltwater creeks and tidal estuaries. The swans nest locally, making large floating islands of weeds. Six or more dull greenish eggs are laid, sometime between August and December. Swans occur Australia-wide, except for the extreme north on Cape York and Tasmania and the arid interior. They are most common on the southern coastal fringes of New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia. The black-winged stilt is a bird found in all the world's temperate and tropic zones, not just in Australia. It sometimes congregates in large numbers in response to major inland flooding, which generates a sudden increase in small aquatic animals like shrimp. It favours the shallow margins of lakes, where it also nests. Sometimes a shallow depression in the ground is enough, though a nest may be formed with scraps of dried aquatic plant material. The four greenish eggs are covered with irregular spots and blotches of dark purplish brown. Stilts breed between August and December. The red-necked avocets may also congregate in large numbers, often associating with stilts along the margins of inland lakes. The avocet has a very specialised upturned bill, which it uses to skim through the surface of the water, sweeping from side to side, catching small aquatic animals like brine shrimp. Its presence here is quite erratic. Avocets nest in a small depression on the ground near the water margins, with a few twigs and pebbles to keep the eggs in position. 
unless the nests are on the margins of temporary islands, they are particularly vulnerable to cats and foxes. This delightful little bird is only about 400 millimetres high. It is an Australian resident. The red-capped plover or dotterel feeds on insects and small aquatic animals. It has been observed sending vibrations into the sand, employing a little foot-tapping routine, presumably to detect small aquatics near the surface so they can be caught. Red-capped dotterels like to nest on little mounds of shells and debris, which gives them a better view of their surroundings. They have been known to nest quite some distance from the water. The breeding season is from August to December. Usually two eggs are laid, which are heavily marked with dark brown and purple spots and blotches, which camouflages them quite well. The young are similarly marked. One of the few oceanic birds to nest on the mainland is the little tern. Most oceanic birds prefer to nest on offshore islands where security is better. Little terns arrive here in November and return to the South China Sea area in March. They are one of the smallest of the seabirds. They nest here, but they also nest in the north. In Japan, they even nest on the roof of high buildings. The only concession to a nest is a hollow depression in the ground, without even a few scraps of shell or debris to mask its presence. Eggs are, however, well mottled. Both eggs and young are a target for cats, foxes and ravens. On New South Wales coastal beaches, it is a miracle that any young survive to adulthood. The New South Wales Park Service tried to provide shelters for the young with old plastic flower pots, but ravens quickly learned that the flower pots sheltered young defenceless birds. The young are mature enough to join their parents returning to the north in March. To get to Lake Wallambula, turn off the highway at Calendar Street just south of Nowra CBD. Travel through Warriji and follow the road signs to Culborough. Travel through Culborough Shopping Centre and turn off at the Lake Circuit. At the lake there is a picnic area and toilets. There is another access to the lake via Greenbank Grove which begins at the main road directly opposite the shopping centre. Lake Wallambula hosts many migratory species which enjoy protection under international agreements. The birds shown in this video are only a small sample. Some are rarely seen or are only in limited numbers. Lake Wallambula became part of Jervis Bay National Park in November 2002.